All right, sir. It looks like we are live. I want to thank you again for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking out the time to, to join me in uh, sharing the story of Grandmaster Shen and, and the writing of your book. So welcome. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. It's a, it's, it's a fine day in Alabama. Uh, so the rains have stopped for a little bit, but we expect them to continue through the week. But it's, it's a beautiful day. It's good to be here with you. Good to see you again. And anyone else who's watching us today. I went back and looked at uh, the, when the last time we talked, and that was April 28th. It's hard to believe it's, it's been almost two months. Almost two months. How, what's, what's your schedule? What's your life look like since then? My life. <laughs> <laughs> My life has changed dramatically, obviously. Uh, even uh, as a geographer for some 40-odd years at the university, I travel frequently. Uh, with my with my profession, uh, field trips or going in some meetings across the country or outside the country, and then when I became president, I, I traveled quite frequently. Grandmaster Bowen and I shared. We actually split up the travels because neither one of us wanted to get that thirty to forty times. Grandmaster Grandmaster Shin did. That was uh, even our even for us anywhere from almost twenty times we travel. Well, it was quite a bit, and I had five trips already already in the book when this happened, and when we decided to uh, suspend our operations, face-to-face uh, -face operations. So I've been home since <laughs> since uh, early February, and it's kind of like a vacation, but my work has picked up substantially on Zoom or email or phone calls. Uh, and it's all work with the association in some form or fashion. And, and actually, it's been nice. Uh, Rachel and I stayed home for two months with my daughter, Master Morgan, bringing some perishables sometimes to us. But we, we're well off. So thanks for asking. It's, but it has been a life change, not traveling at all. So, uh, so being home, I'm, I'm doing more things here than I've done before. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So... I've done quite a few interviews since the last time we talked. And one of the things that I thought was remarkable was whenever I heard a story about Grandmaster Shin, it was always the first meeting from the first meeting, people would talk about how wonderful a man he was and how different he was from the other Korean instructors that they had either been instructors uh, or, you know, were their instructors or they had met. So I thought that, talking with you and, and sharing some stuff about his book would, would be a great topic. So again, thank you for, for joining me. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, the book was a, a major undertaking. Uh, I've, never, I've never written a book. I've written short things, uh, 80, 90 pages. My, uh, I wrote one, my thesis, uh, my, uh, I think it was my seventh Don thesis was uh, published as a journal, the uh, one called Perspectives on the Tao Tung Su Do. And in that, I was I was trying to uh, talk with Grandmaster Shen. I, I think everybody does. We were talking with him at that time to get approval, but it was to, here's my topic. I, you got this, uh, you got this, this ultimate thing for us, one with nature, and I want to write a book about that or write a thesis. And he said, oh man, that's really a tough one to write about. And I, Little did I know it was really tough, and we're still, because I wanted to know kind of what he meant, but, but what is this journey? And he's not the only one that's used terms like one with nature. So uh, this book was a major undertaking, and it's biography. Uh, so uh, it was something that I had to research a bit to see how people write biographies, uh, what kind of tack do they take, how do they lay out their chapters in terms of progression from front to back, chapter titles, chapter headings, uh, is it all chronological? These are issues that came to my mind. He started back in, uh, I don't know, back in early days of his life as a kid and he just, every chapter is but you 
book is laid out quite a lot. It's got both historical, chronological progression, and then it has a large thematic section, themes, if you might say, various issues like that. So anyhow, I guess that kind of answers your question about have I ever done anything like this before? No. <laughs> what? Why do you think he asked you to write the book? You know, he could have asked a number of people. We've got people in the association that are excellent writers. Thank goodness we do, because they've helped me out a lot uh, in, in getting this book, this particular book done. And I knew these people. I know these people. These are people that you know, you know, the Masters of the Association. Sometimes we don't know everybody's skill sets because they might be a scientist or some something else. And um, but they know how to write, they know how to get things done. So a lot of people helped out. As far as I'm concerned, this might go back to the maybe the second master's clinic. And there weren't many of us there, but I think I was the only college professor, university professor there. Uh, and I, I get the feeling he looked at me that way that since I'm a professor, I can write. And mm -hmm. so, but really, what really got to me when we were down in Florida at the uh, at the master's clinic at uh, the Lake House Dojang, which windows on three sides, well, more, almost four sides, but three sides, lots of windows looking over Lake Jovita, and we're training, and it was the second time we went there, and this time he wanted to start work on his first book, uh, well, second book. The first book was more philosophical, so the second book was going to be more technical. You know what that's like, and, uh, and the third one, and so forth, so... He, uh, we started going through Chung, one at a time, one minute at a time. We already practiced all of that the first time we were together. But he looked at me and said, Strong, you sit down, that little table there, all that paper there, you're going to write down everything that goes on in every movie we're agree upon. <laughs> okay, but I really, I want to be out there training because <laughs> that's what I like to do. But that's, I think that's how it started. So once, in my, in my scribbling, I, I took down every little note, got back home, uh, print, uh, typed it out on my, on my, on my Macintosh and, and sent him a, a copy of it. And that became sort of the beginning of how the first, and, and, and spe specifically the first and the second books were, were done. As we, I think the next year at the master's clinic, he, that was the time when he invited everyone, anyone who wanted to, masters to come early, two days early, I think. And we'd sit there and we'd go over all the notes from last time. And he designated certain people and you see their, you see their pictures in the book. They would prepare to demonstrate those young. And then we're sitting back here in the audience and we'd critique them. Uh, each move, everything they did, ask questions. And he's, he, he, told me prior there strong you be ready <laughs> you know how he does so i had a, i had my computer there and i had a printer as well and this is when he also invited uh master alan shop father to come and prepare photos so we're in a, a place that uh you've not seen some of many of the more recent masters we've been training in the gyms but we had a place called the performance center at the university and it was it has some sort of stadium seating, maybe 200 people, but a big area where we could do this. And so I'm again, the scribe. So as we do this, I'm typing as fast as I can. And when we agree upon Young and all the moves, 20 or, you know, for the Sege or so forth, he said, I agree. This is what we're going to do. Strong, print that out. Yes, sir. And the print key, he goes to the printer, and he takes the microperf, and he walks over to Master Sharp and said, okay, we're going to start doing the photographs now. Uh, so that's how I think this started. He just assumed that, uh, after that, he just assumed that I would, I would do these things, which I'm very happy to do. It was so much fun. And then we did that again. The next year, we did, the, did it again for uh, uh, Il Susik. For book three, Hosin Sul, the technical part, and I think Master Sharp's father was was there for that as well. Same thing, 
uh, he called me said we're going to do this uh, you're going to be writing all this all this down and within uh, he said i'll give you one week and then you send me all that print <laughs> sure. uh, and then of course that went to some other editors and uh, smoothed out the writing and that's that's kind of the way it started and, and after that uh, you know he called on other people and i wrote I wrote some things for him. He would ask me to write some things that he thought could come from me or I could do the research for his, each of his books, the first ones especially. And um, then I edited, helped edit those as many other people did throughout the years. And I don't know, maybe because I'd worked with him in this way, that's why, that's why he asked. Uh, but we have others who could have written a book as well. You know, maybe because we travel together uh, many times and talked about books many times and that's that's just the way it evolved i'm happy to have done that it's you know it was it just felt good you always wanted to work for this man uh, so it was it was it, labor of love if not labor but it was just <laughs> joy of being around him and listening to him and writing and so forth so that's maybe that's how i started he started asking me so i figure that's a long story Yes. No, I, I I think that makes sense, and I can imagine the how how you felt, you know, to take on such a, a task, you know, like you said, pride and just proud that he thought that you were the person to uh, take on that task. Um, real quick before we continue to go, we got a lot of people saying hi. <laughs> uh, Honestly, more than I can uh, rattle off right now, but I just want to thank everyone for, for joining. We got people from Puerto Rico, United Kingdom. Uh, who else we got? Region, got Master Leon or, uh, from Region 23. So lots of people uh, saying hi and, and watching along. So just wanted to say hi to all those people. Well, <clears throat> thanks for watching. Uh, you all are part of this. Uh... This inspiration also and, and part of Grandmaster Shen's life and legacy. So it's, you know, it's easy to write about this. It's easy to talk about this. If anyone hasn't, I encourage you to go back and watch the interview that I did with Grandmaster Strong in April. Because um, we touched on a lot of things more on Grandmaster Strong's background, but we talked about this as well. So I want to get into the book. If you could just share what, uh, how, how, how did this come about? Like the the time when you were in Aruba and he, you know, formally sure. asked you to write the book. This was a this is a great another great experience with him, uh, Grandmaster Shin. We were going to Aruba, uh, and I I don't think it was my first trip. It may have been, but at any rate, Grandmaster Shin was going to be going, so we went, and my wife Rachel went also. Uh, and uh, we had many times to talk together and walk around this part of the city, the, old, the ma major part of the city, not the tourist area. And we were right there, right there by the ocean. The Caribbean is there. And the hotel that we stayed in had, uh, had boats that came right into the, the hotel that we stayed in was uh, kind of for the adult side. And across the street was for families and everything. It, I liked it better. I stayed there in the next couple of years, but they had a boat that took you out to an island, their own island. So, uh, you know, it was like a water taxi. But we also walked around together, and he was having the greatest time of his life, and, and his wife was too. And sometimes they said, Go away, strong, go away, Brady Burgos and Magisa, who would bring some sort of security. We're going to walk by ourselves. Of course, in the book, I said, Well, Freddy Burgos and Magisa kind of hid behind places to watch him to make sure, okay, because we never want to leave him alone. You know, it's a safe place. And I put a picture, the reason I put that picture in here of him holding that mahi-mahi was another delightful moment. Uh, we had breakfast in this place and this palm trees, the wind blows only one direction. So every tree is facing toward the west. Uh, it's always a breeze. And this boat pulls in, and the fishermen get off, two guys get off, and the captain, and they're carrying this big old fish. 
And it's all this beautiful colors. And Grandmaster saw that and just ran and grabbed it out of his hands. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, my, do you really? What's this guy going to say? But he started talking about it and admiring it so much. And we struck up a great conversation with uh, uh, the fisherman and, and the captain. And, of course, he wanted his picture taken. And when I was working on thinking of that chapter, because it was after then that he asked to write, for me to write the book, I was saying, I need that picture. Uh, and so I searched all of my photos and I couldn't find it. And uh, Melissa, uh, uh, Master Noguera, her. And then finally, I talked with uh, Eddie DeVere. He's one of our black belts. He's the CEO of a major corporation there. Mm -hmm helps us out so much and he looked back and he found the picture for me and then that's the picture that I put there and uh, we talked about it and then uh, we had such a great time the whole whole time so it was probably one of the most fun experiences with him in addition to the training uh, was with him was always great uh, the testing the championship all the news services were there for him. The TV was there. The newspaper was there. And it's a small place. You know, it's only like 18 miles, six or seven miles wide. I think he's been there. Uh, but uh, so the word was out all over. And uh, even when I went to train in the wellness center of the hotel, the guy said, oh, I thought I saw your picture with Grandmaster Shin. So uh, everybody knew about it and knew about Tonksado on the island. So we got a great amount of publicity. He liked that from the point of view that it supported Tang Sudo, not focused on him necessarily, but he was our, our person. And then, um, I, I, I don't mean to ramble so much, but there was one thing I wrote about in the book that was <laughs> so much fun and uh, interesting to him, because Melissa said, we're gonna do a demonstration and Grandmaster and uh, Master Strong and I think Master Borgos and a couple of other masters. And we met just beside the hotel in this grassy lawn, beside the major street going through this part of town. And behind us is the parliament. And we're out there training. And here's five o'clock traffic. And here's the big building behind us. And Grandmaster Shen looks at me and he said, Strong, why are we here? The traffic is there. It's five o'clock, it's hot, and we're training in this grassy area. <laughs> My only quick response was, Grandmaster, I think it's five o'clock and all these people coming by, this is great advertisement. And he just, as he did, he cackled, you know, it's laughter, like, oh, wow, that's just great. So all these people coming by. That sets the scene for us living, leaving Aruba with such great feelings of the championship and the training and camaraderie and just him. Because uh, his presence uh, was so, so perfect, so enlightening, uh, so supportive of everyone. Uh, us, there were a lot of people there uh, from outside the country and, of course, from inside the country, just like he does, like he did in other places we travel to. But it seemed a lot delightful time for him. And, you know, in retrospect, later on, when he called me, think about this was probably one of his most fun experiences uh, for both him and his wife. So, you know, it was kind of inspirational to be there. Uh, and then some weeks later, he called and had some bleeding and, and announced that he had cancer and made the request. Uh, if he said, I want you, you put it this way, I want you to write my biography. It's not like, would you just, I want you to do that. So, wow, you know, that's a, I, 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 I kind of thought of it, this is an enormous task uh, to write about a man like this who has such, such a history for us, you know, because we, we, know, we know him from what we do with him and have done with him for all these years. Uh, but it didn't, didn't deter me. I just thought that, uh, what, what a grand grand request uh, that he would trust me to do that. Now, I lost a lot of sleep worrying about this too. How do you write a book about him? Uh, where do you start? Uh, 
where people have written big books and so forth and never written, I've written some small biographical sketches, but a book, how do you start this? And so that was, <clears throat> that was in my mind also that this is certainly a challenge, big challenge. It must be done well. And I was hopeful that I would be up to the challenge of doing that. Uh, fortunately, I, you know, we have an association with people who are willing to help you go the extra miles. Lots of people helped out along the way. Whether it was me sitting down day after day, some days writer's block, trying to get this done. So there were a few things that helped prompt me along the way. People, for sure. <clears throat> but I was having some troubles. You know, where do you start? about this man and, and, and what transpired in that following year was he got sicker and, and sicker. We talked on the phone and then he, in, a, in a sense, he got too weak to talk, I guess, but we never, we never got that face to face again. Uh, he just said, wait, I'll be better. You know, soon we'll get back together and we'll do this. Well, it, you know, he died within the next, by the next year, he died. Uh, not long after he'd returned, not long after he'd moved into headquarters, two months later. But by that, uh, by that time, we were, we were moving along with the book. So um, a lot of things go through your mind when you're trying to do that. Uh, you ask, what's the inspiration to writing a book? Of course, it was Grandmaster Shin, but you know, you've got to have inspiration along the way as well. Because when you have a task like this and you're uncertain what to highlight, what to emphasize, where to get this information, since I can't be there in front of him to interview uh, and get his thoughts about all of this. And as I found out later, much of the information about his early life was lost in transit from Korea over here. After Mrs. Shin moved over a year later in 69, a lot of their memorabilia was lost in the transit. But writing also, you know, it's different from academic writing, just um, academic type work. Uh, there's similarities, of course, but it's different. And then how do you write it to get the voice correct that people would like to read and you, you emphasize things that are, what do you emphasize? What are the most important things to emphasize about his life? I was, I was, as anyone does, just writing things like this, and this takes it takes years. Let me tell you, it took a long time. But I was inspired. <laughs> Another way, coming back from the World Championship, we stopped in Asheville, and uh, I was I was stymied. I had been collecting information and doing research and really written any substantive thing yet because I couldn't figure out just how to start this process, I guess. And I went to a bunch of bookstores, walking downtown and looking at books they had on writing and I walked into one bookstore and there's this big rack right in the front about writing. And I'm looking at it, say grammar books and reference sections and so forth. And oh, this is kind of cut and dried. I've, I've done stuff like that. But the one that caught my attention that I've recommended to other people that are writing. It was entitled Writing Down the Bones. <laughs> I said, and I said, oh, that, that title caught me. Let me see what this means. I looked at the title contents and I don't know, 14th chapter said, Writing Like a Samurai. I, well, this has got to be a book. I mean, it's, there's a martial arts focus there. But it was a book of many chapters, but they're all short, three, four, five pages. But it was a book that relaxed me. I mean, it's been in, I don't know, several 20, 30 editions. It has inspired so many people, but it changed my attitude about the writing process. You know, I can, I can get the data, but the uh, writing, writing process was causing me to slow down. So that was very influential in inspiring me to get started. And um, after that, it was, I have two offices. I have this one at home. And I have two computers set up. And then I had an office at the university. They let me keep after I retired. And the internet was faster there than it was here, but I have it 
reasonably fast now. Gideon has set that up for me. So I could, I could, I could go there. It was inside a special office, inside the graduate student's office. So if I had a technical problem or something issue, I could talk to a grad student who may be doing something that could fix the computer along the way. So a couple of years of sitting and working with them, some graduated during that time, but they were, they were helpful along the way. So if I could put that inspiration, one was being a Grandmaster Shin there in Aruba, such a delightful time and still the good feelings despite the fact that, you know, he announced to us he had cancer. He was always upbeat about it. He was, he was going to conquer it. But that plus inspiration from the book I read that helped me get started the writing process and the willingness of people to help along the way was was very instrumental in keeping me focused when I lost focus. And it's easy to do that because you get so tied up with so much work, so many words, so many pages. So, but anyhow, that kind of gives you an idea if we talk about inspirations and uh, how, I, how I got to that point. Excellent. Could you just tell me the name of that book one more time that you... It's called Writing Down the Bones. Writing Down the Bones. Hold on one second. I'm going to pull it up and show it to you. Okay. Again, I want to thank everyone uh, for saying hello. Master Godwin, Miss Russell. Yoshi, you kind of got your, your question answered. Uh, there it is, Writing Down the Bones. Reading the Writer Within. Excellent. I recommend this for anyone who's going to write a thesis. It doesn't tell you how to write it, but it, it does in a way. But the main thing about what this woman says, just write. It doesn't matter what you write. Mm -hmm. Write. Get started. Don't worry about trying to be perfect every sentence. And I've told myself that for other things I've written. Uh, oftentimes, well, for my, every time I took a test, like, sixth degree, seventh degree, eighth degree. I always sat down the next week and wrote out everything I remembered about what my test was like. So I have that for myself, but it was just freestyle. And that's the way she approaches it. You come back, and then you cut, paste, and smooth things out, give it to somebody else to help edit, and so forth. So I recommend that for people writing theses. I also think that's a great inspiration for people who you know, see you as, as a leader and just like, oh, Grandmaster Strong can do anything. But it's, it's nice for people to know that, you know, you have writer's block just like anyone else. And if you just put your mind to it, you can accomplish whether it's writing a book or a thesis or whatever the case may be. You just got to sit down and like you said, just write it or just do it. Sometimes I just rejoice when I could get a, a paragraph done in the morning. <laughs> I said, oh, wow. I can say, Rachel, I finished a paragraph or I've now I've got two pages today I've worked on and I got that. And you add that up over a long period of time, then you you'll get there. So it is. It's an arduous process, but you know, it's rewarding personally uh, to, to do these things and get that experience. You mentioned earlier, you talked about you were starting to accumulate information. Uh, where where did you start? Like whether it was get, getting uh, information, documents, talking to people, did you, I'm sure that was just in itself was a monumental task to undertake. It was. Uh, Grandmaster and I talked frequently and he had some ideas um, about some things to write about. And he had some ideas of people that I might talk with, especially from the early, from the early days. Um, and that was good for me. But of course, in some way, we, we weren't able to talk very much during the last, last part of his life. So, I, I worked with Gideon, and Gideon uh, went to headquarters many times to look through all the files of everything, anything he might have written, and 
discovered, which I guess I knew in the back of my mind, and you do too, you, you've had newsletters before, but fortunately, Grandmaster Shin kept copies of everything he wrote, at least from 1962 onward. <clears throat> That's a long time back. And Gideon had made copies of many of these for me to read. <clears throat> and they're sequential. There's a few missing, but most of it's there and hundreds and hundreds of things. 62, you know, it was around the same time that Grandmaster Bodwin was, was there in Korea and he finished his black belt in May of that year. But already he had taught Chuck Norris and several others and they were back in the country. And he wanted to keep up with them. He wrote information letters uh, and sometimes had them sent through the secretary who was an American Air Force person there and they were sent by uh, the uh, military post so they get back quickly. But I think he called those information letters. So that was a great discovery for me. Because where else do I find information, you know? And going through these things, Grandmaster Shen had started like a, uh, a legal pad with some dates uh, about his history. Just, just, little, just little notes. Like in 1962, this happened. 1963, this happened here. I was over here. I think he said got married uh, at this time and uh, got my six degree belt or promotion at this time. And little vignettes here. And that goes up. Uh, I don't have it here with me, but I, I have a big chart on the side of the lad on the table. And I, I just wrote this down in chronological order from the time he started with this, which was around 60, 58 or so up until probably around a little after 2000. And then he wrote some narratives after that for a few years. But these were all this date, this happened, this date, this happened. And so this, this was what got me started, was looking at the chronological history that was important to him. So I had this, I had this taped up on the wall for a while, looking at it. And then as I would find information from trade journals that I had, lots of them, and people sent me, a lot of people. Master Godwin sent me a, many things, Master Tori, and Sulich. Um, people were sending me the parts of their thesis, uh, anecdotes about them. And one of these days we'll publish all those anecdotes, got a lot of those uh, about their experiences with him. Uh, so I would fill that in until I, what, I, what I saw was kind of a chronological focus. But I didn't want it to be like, you know, some of the history books I had in the past were to me a little bit boring because it's one date after another and I had problems memorizing dates until I could put it in a geographic perspective after I took geography, then all that makes sense. But I wanted more than that. So I really highlighted major things that happened. And some of it was 1968 moving here, had more detail about that. And then in the early 70s, 74, with, and then 75, when the Mutaquan established uh, the U.S. Tonsudo Mutaquan Federation, and the Grand Master had already started the U.S. Tonsudo Federation. They added Mutaquan to the title to separate the, the names from it. He established the other one, and they added this to it. But in 75, he was no longer part of the administrative hierarchy. So that's in there. Um, so that got me started, and I would every time I'd find something, I would put it there, so it would give me some information to add to the ultimate book, I guess you might say. But with this information, I didn't want to just go 1962 or 1958 or when he was born, 36, all the way up to the time he died, just one chapter after another. So I decided to divide it up like you, like you see it uh, in the book. So let's have my trusty copy here. So there are, there are a few chapters, the first four or five chapters, just kind of following a historical prog progression. And then 
then you have these what I call theme chapters, thematic chapters, uh, beginning with the Ruba situation from Osan to the U.S., origin of association, his promotion, traditionalism, professionalism, brotherhood, a focus on academics in the mind. You know, he was really big on that. And all of us have had to write a thesis or so forth. And actually, the book became my eighth Don thesis. So after I, after I, I guess it was the last time I tested on the floor for the two years, Master Khan, Master Vaughn was on the floor also. So we were probably the last two that tested two years on the floor like that. And you know how they do at the end of it? They say, what's your thesis topic? <laughs> and that's when I told him he had asked me to do this. So then Qigong, uh, a big chapter on the masters and then building headquarters. So I thought a focus like that, uh, a little more personal about his thoughts and his design for the association would be, would be interesting. And there's, there's history in that, there's chronology in that, but it's more focused on an idea. So it made me, it made my writing and my work to some degree, I say easier, because I participated in all these things all these years, the, all the years I had known him, uh, but yet I needed information. Fortunately, uh, headquarters, had digitized all of this information. And it's gonna be in our digital library, but um, I had access to it through the Dropbox. So I started then with the very first document and I can't remember the exact date, it was 1962, but I went through every document and pulled out things that I thought were important for me in the book and just kept writing them down. Uh, this took months and months and months because there was a lot, a lot to read. But wow, I mean, the things that he wrote, things that happened to him uh, along the way, he didn't always say things that happened to him. You could tell by sometimes when he wrote that there was emotion in what he was writing, the disappointment he felt when the, uh, the uh, Mudaquan ousted him in a sense, I use the word ousted, but he was no longer at the administrative structure. Grandmaster Bowden was still there and he encouraged Grandmaster Bowden to stay there uh, for a while, which he did. But uh, most of it was just reporting things and giving his philosophies. And you know, we wrote a whole series of Grandmaster's corners on philosophical issues. So all of that was there and very instructive. So through that long time period, that was good research. Then there were, you know, the, um, the book on uh, 20th century warriors. Uh, I have a copy, a good friend on Weinberg found a copy for me and uh, I have a copy of it now. It's, uh, it's an old issue way from way back. He had only been here a few years, but his name is in that book. He got two or three pages about him. And then all of that was I had all of that writing down and then that's supplemented by reading journals, uh, you know, Black Belt Magazine and Taekwondo Times and their British publications that we used, uh, that I used. And there's also, we were also at headquarters again, we kept so much information, notes he had written and letters that he saved, some from him to various people some from Grandmaster Wang Qi to Grandmaster Bodwin. A uh, letter from uh, Chuck Norris is in there. Uh, so all of these things gave me bits and pieces of information that I could extract and put into kind of the matrix I was establishing. So I, eventually I had these chapter names down that I read off to you a moment ago. I, I don't know if there's a final name, but I had, I had these things off my wall, and I still got some things on this wall back here in front of me that I can always look at to continue to remind me where I am in this process. So, uh, collecting the information was on and on and on. It, it, just, it never ending. And then I had some great interviews and discussions with Grandmaster Bodwin with his time with him. Uh, there's even more there that we talked about years afterwards, 
that that's not in the book, but it just happens as we talk to each other. We we met each other so many occasions and talk to each other weekly on the phone. Uh, and then I, I may have sent out a blanket in for, in, uh, invitation for anyone to send me what they might have. And I was, I was in a sense overwhelmed by what's coming in, the people that wanted to contribute. And I, you know, I can't, I don't want to miss anybody's name, but there were lots of people who were helpful in this. So it's the, it, I wrote the book, of course, and I'm responsible for it, but so many people helped in so many different ways. So the process then, there, there's the process of collecting research, which I call it research data, and then trying to figure out where it should go <laughs> and how much to, to put in there. There were people like uh, Master Kathy Hopkins that wrote, a substantial amount of information about producing the statue. Uh, I, I couldn't put it all in there, but that's another that's another article that should come out one of these days soon. We'll get working on that. Uh, but she she wrote an, an outstanding thing about the the beginning of it and the little model she made all the way up to the casting, and that that's an incredible story of of, uh, of, of artistic ability but also a volunteerism to take the time and the effort to produce what we have there at World Headquarters. So she produced that. It, you know, I, there were people that I asked to help out along the ways and, and I got that. We needed pictures. Ellen Payne volunteered to go out and search the world for pictures. Uh, Jordan Chapel over in UK had some that I used and, and we're using in another book. Uh, it, it then uh, what's it gonna look like? What's the cover gonna look like? Wang, Master Wang Lee designed the cover and you, you know how outstanding, how outstanding that looks. And yeah. then I discovered it, Master Mike Black did typesetting. <laughs> I didn't know how to do any of that. I know the writing part of it. There are people who have these skills in our association that, that have so, um, Master Black completed the final, final design, the layout, the typesetting, and Ben Giddy, and of course, all along the way, providing information, translating things out of Chinese or Korean for me. It was a, I might say, a monumental task overall. And I would lay awake at night sometimes worried about it, and I guess as any writer does, because this is a, you know, it has to be okay. It has to be good. And um, people know I'm writing it. So there's great pressure and anxiety to produce something that is, is worthwhile and, and worthy of, of my writing about him. That gives you an idea. There's a yeah. lot of concern when you have to undertake something like that. As, as a martial arts history buff, I can only imagine how exciting it was to, like you said, sit down and start at page number one and, and just go through all of that history, um, you know, that leads us up to what is now the World Tung Sudo Association. And one of the things that I took from the book was all of the stuff that he overcame, like you said, from his ousting um, by Huang Qi and having, having downtime but then getting encouraged by his loyal students to come back and it's just it's amazing. And it shows the type of man he was to kind of pick himself up and understand that at the end of the day, it was more than just him. And uh, people were looking to have him. Be here. Um, well, you're right. Um, it's an extraordinary story. And, you know, <laughs> I never had a title of a book here, but when I looked at it, like like you're talking here, and you see, he overcame so many obstacles that set him back in in many ways. Uh, I, I mentally, perhaps one or anxiety of this or that and the other, financial setbacks along the way, and it you know it's like a curve. It goes up, it drops down, curve down. The curve is always positive, and that's and then I don't know how long ago it was when we, know, we we started with the drum i think we had it in one of second or third time in florida i think one time we somebody had a can or a uh, 
an old wash, uh, uh, what do I say, a skillet were beating on to beat the drum <laughs> like that to wake up. But, you know, you'd hold that stick up and the drum and, and one more time. That started real early, it became something. And then when I said, wow, what an analogy. Mm -hmm. We look at all these just like you're saying and overcoming one problem after another and this whole debacle here with uh, Muda Kwan and it was an unfortunate situation and the Koreans leaving and some had stayed with him, lived with him and uh, bad uh, business dealings along the way, up and down, up and down. But you know, the word perseverance just pops out. He persevered through all of this. It affected, you know, his family, his family life and so forth. But I mean, this is what he wanted to do. And he was not going to give up his dream, which is very obvious from the work that I read. And I, I'm hoping that's what comes out here. He just he never gave up on this dream of moving forward. Uh, and, you know, of course, knowing that and seeing that and, and everybody else like yourself and Grandmaster Bodwin and others, we could not stop that. You know, we Grandmaster Bodwin took over. And I mean, we skipped a beat, we celebrated his life, but we were challenged by, by his death to maintain the traditions that he, he, he left with us that he wanted us to achieve so that we would continue. I've seen lots of associations in the past. You've read about them in the journals, one of their magazines. The Grandmaster dies, and they split up. They argue amongst each other, and somebody goes here, somebody goes there. They split off from us, but as long as we remain together, we remain true to what we, we know and to his, uh, his design for us, we'll be fine. Absolutely. So, um, you know, get a lot of help along the way after... after uh, writing as much text as I could. I was sitting there one day talking to Rachel and I said, I don't know where to stop. <laughs> you know, when do you stop? I've got to get this out. It's been several years. Uh, I've been promising this book. So I guess at some point in time, I said, okay, I'm not going to write any more new chapters. I'm going to do what I've got, flesh those out, work with them. Um, Master Weinberg and I were good friends. He's a professor type, retired now, but we got together on several occasions at headquarters and uh, he came down to Alabama. We'd sit for several days at a time, going over word for word, uh, smoothing out some transitions and so forth and so on. Master Kelly Goodwin is an incredible editor. Uh, here's a backstory. <laughs> I went to see her out in California, I was out in region, region 20, and she had the manuscript in, in the first historical chapter was information that I'd gleaned from all the work that I had. Now, if you don't know, she's got an incredible Tang Sudo library and she had great depth of knowledge of Tang Sudo in general. She is a treasure for us in that respect. And she came to our hotel room and she had a big bag of books and a computer and, and she put them down and she had already gone through the book and she said, she turned to me and she got to pull up the text and she said, now this time is when people start crying. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what is it? She hit it and all this red, you know, like somebody's redlined everything. I said, oh, this is good because this is the way I work with people, my, my colleagues at the university. We send things back and forth, back and forth. But she had such an in-depth knowledge of historical issues and it, it just worked so well to have her, but Master Strong, you know her, she's done this, Master Marsh, Master Russo, Master Lipstein. Uh, I mean, there are many other people that helped here, even a person I work with in the geography side, she's a National Geographic certified teacher, uh, Tamma Nunley, and even her, her husband, who was a police chief, they read the early chapters because they knew a little bit about this and kind of relieved my mind a little bit of the anxiety and then others that I've mentioned to you already who who helped out so much, especially the editing part of it. It went through many people's minds with suggestions and changes and to make it smoother. So, um, you know, it's a work of a work of many people. It was given to me to get to this point, but so many people were helpful in the process and um, you know, I'm eternally grateful.
for the family of Tung Sudo martial artists that we have. Absolutely, I'm, I'm not surprised that you were able to have so many people to assist you in, in this task in the world Tung Sudo, like you said. Um, you know, finding out that they have all of these things that can help you along the way. Um, moving back, you talked about doing interviews. Could you maybe, could you talk about some of the, the interviews that you did? Were you able to, to talk with any of the, the Korean masters or who did you talk to that, that either led you in a direction or maybe great, gave you a great story about Grandmaster Shin? Most of my stories I decided, <clears throat> I, I knew, I decided would be would come from us, from anyone that was associated with Grandmaster Shin, whether they were Korean people or not. Um, <clears throat> I talked to some people outside our association, like Grandmaster Fred Scott, who was uh, Mudaquan also, <laughs> I, I, on the phone, and I, I've since met him in person. We talked at the national championship, but wow, he was. Um, he bent my ear for an hour. I asked first question, and after that, it was just thrown out. He was, he was, uh, he was not happy of what way Grandmaster Shin was treated. You know, he established his own association event eventually, and uh, so that that was helpful. There's a man named uh, Dan Sagara who has written a history of of uh, Tong Sudo Mudaquan, and he's got a second edition out. That was. That, there's a section in there about Grandmaster of Shin and some things that was fairly instructive. Uh, the Mudaquan has a has a history also, but Grandmaster Shin's name is not mentioned in it. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so uh, I talked also with Mrs. Shin, Robert and Catherine, son and daughter. Uh, but mostly I stayed with people in our association who had known him for a long time or worked with him or had special special relationships in some form or fashion, like uh, Susan Del Bono. Uh, she was uh, one of the first, maybe the first master, uh, but she uh, became the leader. Grandmaster Shen wanted her to start as the chair of the Women and Children Committee. She produced a fine training video out of that back in the middle, six, middle 80s. Uh, so, uh, a lot of information there. Maggie Gonski was a longtime secretary there. Had a lot of backstories. Master, uh, Master Merrill also, especially on the security side. Uh, th there's some backstories I didn't put in for that, but uh, how did this happen and why? <laughs> there's some problems, uh, perceived problems or not. We had really intense security for a championship. I believe it was in uh, Anaheim. There's so some worries out there. Uh, so we had intense security out there uh, uh, for Grandmaster Shin's protection, but nothing, nothing like that has, has really happened. There's some instances, perhaps. Uh, there, uh, we tried to interview some of the Korean masters, but we were not successful. It was not successful to get that done. Uh, some of the letters I had from some of these people, uh, I could have use some of the information from them. I always had Master Winsco, our legal counsel, vet anything, all of the things, just to make sure. And she gave me wise counsel. I mean, we're really fortunate to have her on our association. Uh, things I probably shouldn't say or shouldn't write, which is fine. I didn't want, I didn't want anything controversial. This was focused on Grandmaster Shin, not on controversies about it. But, you know, to mention those things, but mainly to put it in the context that he moved ahead. He, he, he knew what he wanted to do. I, mean, I think the plan was in his mind uh, because we kept evolving and moving forward and gaining membership and it was successful. You know, he was a good manager uh, and he read widely. He wrote a lot uh, and he knew a lot of people out there and he called upon lots of people I found out to get information from them or get a, get the idea, what should I do with this? And, you know, from uh, reaching the masters, Dennis DeMarco had a lot of information, some video work, Master Home Check. Master K was a treasure trove of information. Master Vaughn had written uh, a, uh, a journal article also about him and some good information came out of that. 
Okay, he called on Tim Taylor to help design the building. So that's a good backstory. That's a long story. You know, winnowed that down to fit in there. The Master of the the Kegon Park, Master Schroeder. So, you know, the number of people that are interviewed are probably in the, all in the book uh, who had something to say, had some experience with some part of his life that I was investigating at the time. And I would hear from somebody, well, uh, Master Britt knows more about that situation than somebody else because he was there when it happened. So that's how we we get all of these things. And I've got manuscripts of everything. And I made multiple copies and saved it in multiple locations uh, and then winnowed it down to what you see the 250, 60 pages in the book today. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, again, it's just uh, amazing how many people come together to, to share their story. It just shows you, and probably another 100 people could have easily shared their story as well, and probably more than that, um, which just shows you what an impact the man had on, on the association. And like you said, outside of the association as well. Um, were there any... Were there any physical, I don't know if artifacts are the right uh, quite right word, but um, things you found at headquarters or maybe someone uh, gave you that you thought were perhaps lost to, uh, to history that were uh, particularly interesting in this process? Well, <clears throat> you know, people gave him things throughout his life. <laughs> yeah, you know, we could have a, a museum piece pieces here from all the things that people gave him. But for me, the discovery was that in the back closet, there's a, his office is here, you know, there's a door that goes into a stairwell <clears throat> and it, on the ground floor, he had floor to ceiling bookcases full of three ring binders. He had everyone's application to join the association from the beginning, from Osan based. Chuck Norris's original one is there. Carlos Norris, Norris is there. Grandmaster Bodo and I had a delightful time sitting down one day going through it, looking, and he was had his book out and his application and the people that were with him. So the discovery for me, you talk about artifacts, was discovering things like the letters that transpired that he wrote to other masters, that the masters wrote to him, some that were... Uh, not so flattering in some sense of the word, but it's arguments back and forth between people. That informed me on, on how I should write things and what I should write, but it gave me an insight into him and uh, to basically his philosophy of life and his philosophy of Tang Soo Do, his love. He argued this traditional martial art, it's traditional martial art, he did this throughout his life. So it prompted me to think about uh, a second second edition, not, not a his, historical one like we did for him, his biography, but Dr. Weinberg, uh, Master Weinberg and I have been working on uh, Grandmaster Shin's philosophies. And um, we've been working on it for a couple of several years here and thinking about it. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll have something finalized. We're pretty close, but it's J. Chul Shin one more time, the philosophy. And we're prompted by this because he had lots of philosophy books in his bookcases, and some were dog-eared, some had pieces of paper, some were written into uh, East Asian philosophies. He's looking at, you know, he grew up in a Korean society, Neo-Confucian Korean society, and he was influenced by his mom and dad. His, his father was a, an educator, school teacher, principal, and um, then he, you know, went to college and did well and did at the master's level too, politi political science and international relations, and, and he wrote. So and he, how was he influenced in his life that influenced us as an association, and we have this lingering effect of, of that. So these things, these life, this, these philosophies influence his way of thinking. And I think he was delving into it. He, 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 he learned that through his father and mother, just being part of the culture like we do here, acculturation. But he wanted to just read the antecedents in, in terms of 
Taoism, one with nature, Buddhism, its influences in, in Asia, uh, Confucianism, that influence on life, family life, and relationships. And, and we see that exemplified in his writings. He even mentions these things in his writings. So he thought that might be a good exercise for it. Again, it's, <laughs> it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and thinking and talking with other people. So maybe one day you'll see that. Maybe one day. <laughs> so that's the project. That's what you're working on right now. Or it's close. It's close to the. It's close to the final. Final project. Final product. Here's one that I was curious. How do you find a publisher for a book like this? Or did you already we have one lined up? Uh, Gideon. Um, Gideon is a whiz at doing this. He does the final thing. Sets up the final page, pages, and we have a printer we use and. Uh, we get the, the softback cover, I think, from this printer, and then we get, we get the, uh, the book itself, and it has to go to a different person, a different company to do the hard covers. Gotcha. Uh, but we do it in-house. We publish oh, okay. it in-house. <laughs> are there copies still available? Can you get copies from the association? Oh, sure. Sure. There's, there, there are copies there, and I think there's still some hardback copies left, and there certainly there's some softback copies left. Excellent. Well, there you go. If anyone's watching and, and hasn't read the book, I highly recommend it. Um, contact the association for your hardback or softback copy. And then when we do eventually get back to events, bring your copy and get it signed by Grandmaster Strong. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll be happy to do that. I'll be happy to do it. And let me know your thoughts after you read the book as well. Absolutely. We're, we're at an hour mark here. So I want to start wrapping up. Um, is there anything else you, you would like to share? I, you, it, this has been awesome. And you mentioned about the binders. And just recently, I was going back and forth with Maggie Gonski on Facebook Messenger. And she mentioned those binders, that everyone had a binder. And, you know, when they first started, there were just a few. And then when, when she left, there were so many. <laughs> and uh, it, it, I, I, it's ha makes me happy to hear that they're still, they're still there. <laughs> Oh yes, uh, that was that was good for me because uh, I, I spent a week at a time at headquarters, and I, and for the last three or four years, I've done it every other every other month. Uh, but it was, you know, thank goodness he was a writer. Thank goodness he kept such copious notes, such a large quantity of notes, some handwritten, some typed out. But the three ring binder is just. You just follow the page. Here's Chuck Norris. Here's the next person. These and they're sequential and a date stamp and sometimes pictures. And so he kept that forever, you know, and even records of it. He would go back and put something in there. You know, like I can go back and see that I made these donations at that time period. So I don't remember exactly when these things happened, but it's uh, it's good documentation and and all the the newsletters and information letters, and instructors bulletins. Thank goodness we have we have those, and I can go back and reference those and see those. Uh, you, you've gotten some in your past too, but but we eventually we will have a digital library, and um, uh, the membership will have access access to those those items as well. You can go back and look at these histories as well and see when things happened. You know, when did we start doing the Sega? You know, well, that's pretty well documented at a certain date. It was approved by the board. Uh, and we did, I think it's around 1988 or so, 87 or 88. And we see all these things punctuated all the way through. You know, when he started his Qigong work, that was great. And, you know, Grandmaster Shen had a great deal of fun. You know, he was, he was business, but, you know, he could just break out in shattering laughter sometimes. And, and probably what we remember is uh, the Master Disaster Awards that happened and those are lots of backstories and actually I wrote them all up but I didn't put them all in there I just uh mentioned the process but at the master's clinic when you know there it's always going to be an award <laughs> somebody's always done something there and Master Inosha is a great storyteller to talk about and Grandmaster Shin was always full of laughter for that you know he wanted us to work hard and he had a reason for it he wanted us to propagate uh, the, marsh, the traditional martial art of Tang Soo Do, uh, his, his love of, of Tang Soo Do and all it can give to us. 
more than just physical, uh, but the mental part of it and, and the great spirit that he brought to this. He had fun doing it. He was very serious about it, but we could have a good time with him also. You know, catching dancing on the stage when we're giving out awards down in Costa Rica when Master Angus would play the music and people would dance up to the stage and he would be over there dancing with somebody else or by himself. But it was hard work. Tom Sudo was hard work, physically and mentally. He knew that. But he also knew that we should have fun doing it. And I had fun writing the book. Despite all the anxiety, the tears, whatever happens along the way, I am happy for the experience of doing that. So thanks for the interview. Thanks for bringing me here today. It's been fun talking about all of these experiences. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed the book. And like I said, in, in, in all of this stuff, I, hearing all of the great Grandmaster Shin interviews, I thought it would be a, a nice accompaniment to the book. Just kind of get an interview. Uh, I don't know if you, have you done any interviews in regards to the book? Uh, like if like, this is, you, you're the you're the first one that's done this. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, there you it is. It. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure. And like I said, it, it's really cool to to hear the backstory. And I'm a a huge history buff when it comes to the World Tung Sudo Association and just Tung Sudo in general. So to hear hear this stuff and, and be able to, to get these stories shared, I think it's important, especially in these days where, uh, you know, it's it's nice to, to get something other than everything else that's happening to, to listen to. So, sure. Well, he wanted us to continue. He had great designs for the future. Um, and, you know, the finishing the building and for him to live there for the, even the short time was a really a pinnacle. I mean, we could have continued with him and, and be doing more things today. But fortunately, with people like you and those watching and those who are with us today in the association, we just took the next step. Uh, he would have wanted to do that. When I think about what's going on and the problems I have and the problems of the association, I think, what will Grandmaster Shen do? At this point, how would I think like him? And we move on. He set us up for this. Uh, and we're the recipients of that knowledge, but that skill of bringing people together in such a variety of ways. So I wrote the book, but I had lots of people helping me. So here's Grandmaster Shin. He had lots of people helping with him, and he, he wanted everybody to do this. He was not the dictatorial type. He made the decisions for us. Right. We were pretty happy with, but um, he was a fine man, and we're fortunate to have had him with us for the years that we did. So we'll keep on. Hopefully, everybody stays with us, and we'll get through the pandemic. And one more time, we'll meet back together, maybe in a different normal, but we will persevere and move on through this. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for your time, sir. I really appreciate it, and I will uh, talk to you again soon. Tung Su. Thank you, sir. Everyone, Tung Su. Tung Su.